Good afternoon, everyone. It's 1.02 p.m. We're going to get going. My name is Eric Carlson. I'm a co-founder and a partner here at Propelix. Um, we've had a great turnout today for today's sessions on iBeacons and beacons within the travel industry. This is a really exciting topic. Anytime we have really new technology that can change how we interact with employees and customers, especially something like this that can be so beneficial to the core user experience, um, it's nice to be able to intro and, and be able to talk about some of these new technologies. Um, great to also see so many current clients and, and other folks that we've been talking to on the call. So hello to Mike, Stacy, and Renee. Uh, very nice to have you and, and glad you could join us today. I also want to welcome our speaker, Glenn Gruber. Glenn, it's nice to have you here today. Thanks, Eric. Um, and so before we get started, a couple of housekeeping <coughs> questions. Um, first of all, in, within the WebEx window, there is a little QA panel um, and also a chat button. The, the QA panel, if you have questions throughout uh, Glenn's talk, feel free to drop them in there. I'm going to pull these together, and we'll have some time surely at the end of this call to be able to talk about those a little bit more. Um, also, as always, the recording for this webinar um, in a movie format, as well as the slides, um, will be available for download after the webinar is, is over. It usually takes us a few hours um, to be able to get that done. A little bit on us before we get started. Propelix creates mobile strategies and world-class applications for the enterprise. We have a 100% focus on mobile for the enterprise. Um, we do customer facing, but also on some of the more higher value use cases for employees and partners and distributors, et cetera. We have a 15 year track record on providing enterprise level strategy to Fortune 500 clients, helping build strategies around technology use, but specifically in trying to take advantage of disruptive technologies, both like mobile and beacons on this call. For the last six years, we've been working exclusively within mobile, both in terms of single use embedded devices and, and now riding the wave of consumer mobile devices within the enterprise. Um, we're trying to drive valuable use cases within mobile and not just enabling mobile devices as another screen, but really being able to take advantage of those devices and changing some of the core business processes and simplification. We're based in San Jose with consultants across North America, um, but a lot of our engagements include a global reach due to the clients that we work with. And you can see some of those clients below um, in this list. We really perform three categories of services for our clients. The first one is some of the things we're going to talk about today, which is really around mobile strategy services. These are delivered as fast-paced workshops and engagements as, as quickly as a single week. Um, we build our services and really these kickstarts that you see listed here around specific challenges that we see repeatedly within our clients and within our prospects. And so a lot of work related to mobile app portfolio creation with business teams, taking an area of an idea and building a scoping and planning structure to understand how we would deliver and solve some complex business problems. We're doing a lot with IT readiness for mobility, both for organizations that have yet to start within mobile and understanding what current processes we have within IT and how those would translate into de developing and delivering and securing mobile use cases, as well as doing assessments with IT groups that have performed some work within um, their IT strategy but want to be able to understand where they are versus some of their um, competitors or other clients within the industry. We also offer mobile advisory services. These are structured and really a block of hour type engagements allowing your organization to be able to use our people, our tools, our processes in really more of an ad hoc mode. So we support some clients um, away from structured high momentum workshops into more slower engagements. We also do a lot of speaking engagements both in marketplace but also um, within our clients um, and, and do a lot of work in terms of assisting them with say vendor evaluations and RFP processes in business and technology policy creation, as well as building and running mobile center of excellences. Finally, on the bottom, we tie this all back to delivering managed solutions, where we try to focus heavily on great user experience and application simplicity up front, and trying to build quality, reusable, portable code on the back end. Um, and we perform these webinars monthly, and if this is your first time with us, welcome. Um, you can also view the recordings of any of our previous 20 plus webinars um, on, as well as download the slides from any of those presentations on our website. That's at www.propelix.com and click on the tab that says resources. One other thing before I hand over the, the controls to Glenn, um, I wanted to bring up just briefly the Mobile Research Council. We started the MRC uh, earlier this year to try to fill a few gaps we saw with our clients. Um, first, we, we want to be able to provide access to mobile first um, analyst viewpoints and point of views from a group that truly understands enterprise mobility. And so we joined forces with Maribel Lopez from Lopez Research. Um, and Maribel is publishing 14 plus 2014 research topics in 2014. 
including such things as enterprise mobile management strategies, securing mobile enterprise, mobile application development strategies, platform considerations, et cetera. Um, secondly, we felt there was this big gap between how these viewpoints end up into tactical um, roadmaps for our clients. And so we work um, with our clients to be able to make some of these analyst viewpoints and be able to make some of the strategies very tactical. And so we come in by helping create strategies and deliver them um, through tactical roadmaps for execution. And finally, the area that we, we felt we wanted to be able um, to, to fill a gap was related to collaboration. In the early days of mobile, um, we're finding a great many use cases that have, are beneficial to really hear across industries. And evidenced by a lot of the retail, pharmaceutical, and transportation companies that we have on this call today related to the travel industry. And so the MRC Forum is a way for us to be able to bring a lot of our current clients as well as MRC clients to the table. And these enterprise mobile strategy leaders discuss a lot of opportunities and challenges they're seeing in terms of building out um, their capabilities. So check us out on the web at www.mobileresearchcouncil.com. So enough of my babbling. I'd like to be able to introduce Glenn Gruber. Um, Glenn has been advising travel technology firms and other enterprises on how to leverage mobile within their business for the past five years. He's a leading voice in the travel sector as a contributing node to T News, where he writes about mobile and other emergency technologies and are impacting the travel sector. He's also been a judge at i for travels Mobile Innovations and Travel Awards for the past three years, and he's a senior mobile strategist for us here at Propelix. So Glenn, welcome. Okay, thanks, Eric. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. We've got a pretty packed agenda to cover uh, for a very hot topic in mobile, beacons. We're going to discuss three main topics today. The first is about contextual intelligence. Why is it important in mobile in general? And also, why is it important in specific for travel? Secondly, we'll talk a little beacon basics. What are they? How do they work? And what are some of the key gotchas that you should look out for as you look to implement them? And then we'll hit on what I think many of you are here to learn about. What are some of the key use cases for beacons in the travel sector, primarily focusing on airline and hotel today? And of course, we'll try and, as Eric mentioned, save some time at the end for any questions that you might have. As he said, please send in those questions via the Q&A dialog in the WebEx control panel. We'll try to get to as many as we can today, and those that we don't get to, we'll respond to individually. So let's get started. Personalization merchandising, loyalty, omni-channel, social. These are some of the watchwords of today's travel industry as we all strive to better know the traveler so that we can better serve them whenever and however we can. This is especially true as the fight for the traveler's attention gets rougher. Conversion rates are critical and upsell and cross-sell of products and services are the razor's edge on which profitability lies. But as an industry, a lot of this is still aspirational. It's not that no one's doing it, but I would say that it's far uh, from mainstream. Many of the offers that I still get today from airlines and hotels where I'm a loyalty member still don't receive, seem to reflect a lot of knowledge about me, my preferences, my transaction history, let alone where I am at a given moment and doing at a given time during my travel. Though all of that can greatly impact my readiness to receive and propensity to accept those offers. So let's look at a few data points from the airline and airport sector to drive home a little bit of why this matters. Today, airports receive 47% of their revenues from non-aeronautical sources. And we'll talk a little bit about the uh, evolution of airports in a moment. But the question is, how can airports drive this number higher? Secondly, global ancillary sales are estimated to be over $42 billion in 2013. As you can, as you can see by the graphic, it has a, it's had a major impact in whether or not airlines are or are not profitable. And this is up from virtually zero in 2007. These are huge numbers, but much of it is being driven by things that people have to have. It's bag fees or change fees. These are not necessarily optional. And but now when you look at a lot of the premise behind NDC and Direct Connect discussion, I'm going to stay out of the politics of that conversation, but a lot of it has been around the control over offer creation and presentment to provide more tailored offers uh, to travelers, which hopefully lead to greater acceptance and greater ancillary revenues. So the question is, how to provide the right offer or information at exactly the right time is more important than ever. Our customers now expect that we will do this better and better, and mobile is one of the key reasons for this. 
The ability to be connected at all times has created an expectation that any desired information or service is available on any device in context at your moment of need. And while the consumer is often the focus of our attention, our employees have this ex expectation as well. How they do their job and how well they do it can be positively impacted by knowing where they are and what they're doing and providing them guidance along the way. But where do we get the clues that can ensure that we arm our customers and employees with the information that they need at these moments of decision? This dovetails perfectly with our top prescription for 2014 from the Mobile uh, Research Council. As noted in our recent webinar just a couple of months ago, uh, integrating context into the app is one of the key uh, prescriptions for 2014. It's no longer enough to provide access to information wherever and whenever the user is. The power of mobile is unleashed precisely because we're able to deliver relevant information that the user needs or influence behavior because we know who they are, where they are, and what they're doing. And as we move into the future, increasingly the difference between good and great mobile experiences is going to be based on how well contextual intelligence is integrated into the app experience. And this is why beacons are an important development. So contextual intelligence, to talk a little bit more about that, can help, but really can help determine what those moments of need are by understanding past history as well as ambient information about the user. And there are several elements I want to touch on really quickly. Motion, you know, are they stationary, are they moving, are they walking, running, or driving down the highway at 65 miles an hour? Hopefully that informs what kind of information and what kind of engagement we expect to have with that person at that time. Social, you know, looking at what information are they sharing on social networks uh, can provide a lot of clues to what they're interested in. Behavioral, looking for patterns around time or locations or relationships. Transaction history, what purchases have they made in the past that might provide a clue towards future action. Environmental, and then finally, location. Where are they now? And location is certainly one of the more powerful contextual triggers. But we're pretty early in the game. You know, we haven't really gotten all that far at all, actually. You may be familiar with the Gartner hype cycle. I'm sure you, you all are. Uh, it's, but it's a pretty convenient way of pointing out kind of where we are in the effectiveness of adopting a new emerging technology. From an industry perspective, you know, as we look at contextual intelligence, most of it is around simple offer presentment rather than being tied to how we deliver our products and services. Um, Google Now is actually you know, trying to do a lot around that, taking information that they have uh, about what we've searched for, uh, looking at information that we share on social, looking at our calendar um, and our location to try and say kind of what's next and provide meaningful information to you. But there's a lot of tr untapped potential that is gonna let companies and developers unleash some really valuable applications into the future. And technologies like Beacons will help us move forward. Now, you might say, well, Glenn, yeah, we have a lot of location data available to us today. So why are Beacons important? Well, that's true, but there are a few things that are lacking. And I'll sum that up by, by accuracy, granularity, and energy. Now, GPS is built into virtually every smartphone, but it is often too imprecise to measure location um, in, a meaningful, in a meaningful way and only works really when you're in an outdoor environment, when there's line of sight to the satellite spinning around the Earth. So that's why it's great for road navigation or walking down the street. However, much of the travel experience takes place indoors, be it in an airport, a hotel, or attractions like you know, museums. And it's also downright hostile towards battery life, which I'm sure we all have personal experience with. Um, now for indoor applications, uh, you can use things like Wi-Fi triangulation, but they lack a lot of the precision to uh, require to act as really meaningful triggers for contextually intelligent applications. So let's talk a little bit about proximity versus location. They're not the same thing, but it's important to understand the difference. Beacons don't calculate location. They calculate proximity to an object um, or even maybe a person, which means that in, what's cool about this, it means that instead of just mapping to a specific geographic location, you can attach beacons to things that move or are moved, people, assets, planes, 
you know, as an example. And yeah, then you can still use proximity in a meaningful way. So, you know, because often just a simple X, Y coordinate isn't all that helpful. But, you know, proximity can, can do a lot. So location is an important indicator of context, but it's not the same. You know, the fact that you're in a particular location is an important data point, but there's a big difference in how likely you are to be interested in a particular object based on whether or not you're in the general vicinity or if you're right next to it. And you know, let's just forget travel for a minute completely. Let's say you're taking a walk in the park and you see a pretty flower. You know, now, if you simply remark upon it from afar, or if you walk right up to it uh, to learn more about it, it, tells us a lot about your interest and what kind of interaction you're, you, know, you might want to have. And the same applies for any interaction with companies in, in mobile, you know, with consumers in mobile. So pro proximity enables you know, what we have Propellics are starting to call microfencing. It's like geofencing, but geofencing operates at a much more, uh, much larger scale. Microfencing works on a much more granular level. And as you can see by the little graphic here, um, beacons have three major intervals that, when you're doing ranging, trying to figure out proximity, um, that they fit into. There's immediate, which is about a half a meter, uh, near, which is less than two meters and far, which is around 30 meters or, or 90 feet. So based on understanding proximity with those intervals, you can more intelligently deliver information and offers or trigger actions based on proximity, ensuring that the relevancy of the information is aligned with the intent. And the, we are not overwhelming the user with a myriad of off-target messages. So income beacons. Beacons help us, is a technology that helps us bridge the physical and digital worlds. It's a proximity-based technology that enables micro-location targeting to connect you to the things around you so that the business can deliver the right information or offer or trigger an event at the right time. It can be informational, it can be transactional, but it's got to be relevant. So there's a lot of buzz about beacons in retail. That's, that's what's been getting the most attention. You know, the idea that you can use proximity to create offers and incentives as someone enters a store, drive conversion and remove friction from the checkout process is great. And that doesn't even begin to address things like making a recommendation for complimentary items or monitoring dwell time to notify a sales associate that a customer might need some assistance. And some very big brands, as you can see by the logos on the right here, are already taking action with significant pilots or rollouts. It's happening in the sports world, too. Uh, I'm a big sports fan, so I'm kind of highlighting this one. Major League Baseball has rolled out about 2,000 beacons across 20 different ballparks and integrating the beacons into the At the Ballpark app to enhance the fan experience, whether it be with coupons for concession stands, helping you find your seat, or delivering additional content about the team in history. Now, the, as you can see by the picture, the first implementation was at City Field. Sadly, yeah, as a Mets fan, I can attest that this is probably the only area that the Wilpons have invested in over the past couple of years, and, you know, but I digress. I, it's too early in the season for me to get too depressed, so let's move on. Now, let's talk a little beacon basics. So what are beacons? Beacons, yeah, many times referred to as iBeacons, which is the Apple branded name uh, for the, their implementation of the technology are really small devices that transmit small packets of data using the Bluetooth low energy uh, specification. Now, Bluetooth low energy is also referred to as Bluetooth LE or BLE or Bluetooth Smart or Bluetooth 4.0. It's all the same. Um, but as the name implies, one of the key attributes is that beacons consume very little power which enable the physical beacons to last for up to two years of operation on a small coin battery. And just as importantly, they don't drain the smart device's battery as GPS or Wi-Fi connections are prone to do. The devices are also really inexpensive. Many of them, uh, and they're made available by all sorts of different brands. PayPal, Estimode is very popular. Uh, Qualcomm with their gimbal product line. Um, yeah, they're available for under 50 bucks, and that's before any economies of scale of volume production. So expect prices to drop even further as they're rolled out more. And they're really small. 
many of the, some of these are not even any larger than a quarter. Now, a couple of other things I want to highlight. One, there's adjustable range. You have the ability to adjust the power output of the beacon, so which allows you to control the available range of the beacon, which in certain use cases could be really useful. Um, they also operate at two, the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, and I'll get to why that can be important a little bit later on. And also that they don't need to pair with a mobile device, like, to, like the, be, the Bluetooth that we all kind of know and love with our headsets uh, require us to do. So it's a lot easier for, for users to start using this without having to take any steps. So let's talk a little bit about how it works. So contrary to what a lot of people believe, beacons aren't sending out all the offers and alerts to phones. All they're sending out is what's known as advertising packets, small bits of data that identify the unique beacon. Um, the main parameters are a UDID, unique device identifier, and then what are known as major and minor values. Let me put that in travel terms for you. So let's consider that we have a beacon at the airline counter at gate 24 in Boston's, Boston Logan's Terminal C. Um, so the UDID, which is the serial number, can be you know, anything 54321. Uh, the major value might be BOS, which will be used as a top-level identifier to indicate that this beacon is in the Boston Logan Airport. And then the minor value might be CG24A to denote that that beacon is specifically located at the airline counter in, at gate 24 in Terminal C. So, but all the beacon does is send out this message and it wakes up the listener to let them know that they're there. And then that, you know, then it sees, oh, okay, I see the beacon. And from there, the app can determine the proximity to that beacon using what's known as the RSSI or Receive Single Strength Indicator. Um, and so we're done, right? Well, not exactly. Beacons are only one part of the puzzle. Just because you have a device that can see a beacon doesn't mean that anything is going to happen. You need an app or even just a passbook card uh, that will recognize the specific beacon and then know what to do with the message that it receives. And this is where the magic happens, all the offers, all the content, what you see depending on whether or not you're 50 feet or 5 feet away. But you don't want all that intelligence to be built into the app itself. Rather, you want to manage all of the triggers and all the business logic for each beacon on the server side, somewhere in the cloud or in a data center so that you can manage all that content dynamically rather than hard code into the app itself. This will also make life much easier when you add more beacons to a location, add new locations, or dynamically change the information offers or the location of the beacon. Otherwise, you'd be relying on individuals to continuously up, keep their apps updated, which is really a very poor strategy. Um, the last but most important, but important piece is what I call the beacon management function. And unfortunately, this is probably the most immature area of the beacon ecosystem today. But let's talk a little bit about what the beacon management system should do. Um, you're you're going to need a way to change the firmware on the beacon to program the major and minor values. Um, and you have to do that uh, close up because beacons uh, only communicate over the Bluetooth LE spec. They don't communicate with the web because they lack any Wi-Fi or other broadband connection. So you need an app or something that will communicate with the beacon and provide the updates to the firmware. And also, just you know, think about any other kind of network that you look to manage. You want to be able to check the state of the beacons. Are they working? Are they even there? You know, so you know, a lot of things to consider there. And I think that this is an area where we'll see a lot of evolution. There are companies like Radius Networks that do provide some solutions to this, but like I said, it's very early. So that leads me to you know, the five things of what to watch out for with beacons. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more and we'll uncover more as we go, but you know, this is at least a good list to start with. So first is security. You know, as I just mentioned, there's a limited ability to monitor a beacon. Um, you know, unless you're, you're right there on premise. So that makes it hard to know uh, whether or not your program is not going well because there are some inherent design issues or maybe all the beacons that you put out there are gone. Um, and that you know, can pose some security risks, you know, such as stolen beacons. There's also you know, the fact that 
you can clone, you know, there's the potential for cloning of the beacons and clone those identifiers onto other equipment. You know, there's a lot of devices that are BLE enabled, um, like uh, iPhones, like Nike fuel bands, and you know, many other devices. Um, but many of those can't, you know, don't just act as something that recognizes a beacon and does something with it. They can actually act as beacons themselves. So people could potentially be walking around with phones and uh, spoofing uh, real beacons, and yeah, you know, perhaps uh, you know that can lead to all sorts of shenanigans. Um, also, you know, they're as good as the beacon technology is today and the Bluetooth LE is today. Um, there's still a little bit of imprecise measurement of distance. It's pretty good, but it's not perfect. You're probably looking at 10, 15 percent uh, variation. Um, but the good thing is that the scale that we're typically measuring is a lot smaller than we're measuring with other technologies like GPS or Wi-Fi. So the margin of error is on a relative basis much smaller too. Um, now collisions and interference. And as I mentioned before, these beacons operate at 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. And that's where a lot of other electronic equipment lives, let alone other beacons in the vicinity that, you, that you'll be installing. So there is a chance for some signal interference, um, which can lead to people dropping or not seeing different beacons as you had hoped them to. And it's something that you have to plan and test for during deployment. Uh, false negatives is an, another concern. And what do I mean by that? Well, you can you could go out of your way to try and hard code some sort of logic around how you hope that, beacon, that, that people are going to interact, uh, you know, sequencing the different beacons as they move through a room or a location. Um, but even if you try and prioritize it, you, know, you still may have people toggling between beacons or if they, there's interference and they lose connection, it's going to look like they've moved out of range and then magically appear back in range uh, yeah, right away. So the challenge with that is that you may trigger sending of a message that the traveler just got like five minutes ago and they start to not have a great experience and say, why are you sending this to me again? Um, and then lastly, yeah, I want to mention that there's going to be a learning curve. Beacons are new. Beacons with travelers are new with any use case for that matter. Um, so how often we send messages to them, what kind of proximity creates the best response is still all up in the air. Um, experimentation is going to be called for and best practices you know, are going to emerge. There's also a learning curve in terms of you know, looking at it from a privacy perspective. Um, I'm going to say that most people are not going to, be, not going to know how to turn off uh, the beacon uh, capability on their device. Um, so, I think that there's going to be a lot of learning that goes on uh, from the user side as well as from an app developer side, and I think there's going to even need to be some education that's done from uh, an OS side as well. So now let's turn to some of the use cases, um, which I know many of you are waiting for here, here in the travel sector. So mobile is transforming many industries, travel probably as much as any. The out of homes, yet often in unfamiliar place nature of travel, has made it a perfect fit for mobile. The travel industry historically has been one of the most aggressive adopters of technology to enhance the business and has similarly been leading in adoption of mobile technology. The primary emphasis, predictably though, has been in the researching and booking phase of travel, as well as itinerary management and monitoring. But other than the mobile boarding pass function, there's been very little attention paid to using the mobile device and the ambient information it can capture as a way to enhance the travel process or interpret, predict, and serve the customer needs during their journey. For many years, though, one company has been rumored to shake up the travel industry uh, even further with interactions with smartphones. And yes, I'm referring to Apple. The off-rumored but never spotted iTravel app, I like to call it the travel industry's Sasquatch, um, was supposed to have the same impact on the travel industry as, app, as Apple had on the music industry, publishing, and with carriers. Now we know that when the iTravel patents were first revealed uh, about four years ago, NFC was supposed to be the primary driver for all the functionality. But we also know that Apple has systematically eschewed NFC 
uh, over the intervening period, maintaining that there may be other technologies which could do the job as well, if not better than NFC. And, while, and all the while, they've invested in Bluetooth LE, embedding in iPhones, iPads, and even Apple TVs for the past three years, even though up until iOS 7 came out, there was really no way to take advantage, advantage of that embedded technology. So perhaps Bluetooth LE in the form of beacons will be what unlocks the potential energy of the proximity-based services and interactions laid out by Apple and the iTravel patents. Maybe iTravel will be one of the new product launches that Tim Cook has said he has in store for us in 2014. Maybe not. We'll find out in a few months at WWDC. But either way, as we start to think about different use cases, the iTravel patent portfolio can provide a pretty good guide. So let's look at uh, airlines and airports for a moment. The airport, the airport experience is changing pretty dramatically. Long gone are the days of arriving at the airport just before your flight and sprinting through the terminal like OJ. Airports have evolved to a point where they're almost destinations to themselves, providing travelers with options for entertainment, dining, and shopping. Pictured here is the Mini Rijks Museum at Amsterdam Schiphol Airport, where works of the Dutch master are displayed, JetBlue's new Terminal 5 at JFK, and the Monster Shopping Concourse in Dubai, which is larger than probably any mall that I've been to here in the U.S. And there are plenty of similarly improved airport experiences popping up everywhere. The evolution is happening in large part because of post-9-11 security, the rise of hub airports and long layovers and the increase in international travel. You're at the airport for a long time and people need distractions to make that time pass a little bit more quickly. Because of the increasing complexity and personality of airports, beacons can be really important in enabling passengers to better take advantage of all they have to offer and to drive some more of that non-aeronautical revenue. And there are many opportunities to improve the traveler's journey throughout the airport using beacons, and we'll touch on a couple of those now. You know, the question is, as you look at these different stages of the journey, what matters to the traveler at each of these moments? Where can proximity act as a trigger? So let's take the case where as the traveler enters the terminal and say that there's a beacon at the entry. So as, you know, as they walk into, uh, it can provide an opportunity to trigger different offers based on what we know about the traveler. We know what flight they're gonna be on, what their flight status is, and also if we have the information from the airport itself, how busy you know, the airport and the security lines are. This, prevents a, this presents a, a great opportunity to drive the kind of spur of the moment purchases of ancillaries using proximity as a triggering event that don't often convert when a traveler might receive the same offer uh, a couple of weeks or a couple of days or even a few hours in advance. So, you know, if the airport is busy providing access to priority check-in lines or expedited security um, might be something that people will buy up on. Um, if we know that their flight has been delayed or maybe we've had to make a reaccommodation for them already, maybe we'll offer up a day pass to an airline lounge and then just other traditional ancillaries like seat upgrades. So let's go back to those eye travel patents again. Um, maybe we want to remove the uh, check-in desk. Um, there's a lot of kiosks already, but maybe we can take that a step further. So say as you start to approach the check-in and uh, the uh, baggage area, um, the beacon triggers the check-in automatically, prints a bag tag, and it would be great if we could use, say, Touch ID uh, on uh, the iPhone to authenticate that it's a valid passenger. Of course, right now there's not an open API to Touch ID, but that may change as well. But you get the idea. First of all, it you know, makes it easier for the passenger, and it also enables the, it has the potential to enable the airline to reduce staffing and operating costs. And we can make navigating the airport a lot better. Once you arrive at the airport, the biggest challenge is figuring out where you, what, where you have to go, what you can do, and where things are. Now, this might be not so challenging if you're in your home airport or if you're a frequent traveler, um, but as it is when you're traveling. Yes, beacons can help with navigating through the terminal, but that's just the start. I've pictured here a couple of screens from GateGuru which is many travelers, including mine, go to you app for helping travelers navigate these new airports. But the information is often limited 
and the, as you can see by the, the map here on the left. And the offers, if there are any, are static rather than dynamic. The app doesn't know where you are in the airport. There's no way to interpret interest or intent and to really encourage spur of the moment purchase. But if you begin to combine proximity with time of day, how much time they have before their next flight, you can start to intelligently change offers and invoke them based on proximity and do great things to not only serve the traveler but increase revenues uh, for concessionaires, for the airlines, and the airport. And the other part of navigating the airport is when you get off the plane. Like a lot of people think, I'm just on my way out. What happens when you come back in? Um, connecting passengers make up an important percentage of travelers, up to 40% in major hub airports. And delays or misconnections can result in real issues for both the traveler, the airline, and the airport. Identifying travelers with connections and helping them navigate to their next gate with beacons has a lot of strong potential. Place a beacon you know, right at the gate, and as soon as you walk off, you get a message that says, oh, your next uh, uh, flight is at gate B2, make a right, it's three minutes down, and there you go. Um, and for passengers who have completed their travel, similarly, you can just simply inform them what carousel to find their baggage on and direct them to it. Another use case could be access to executive lounges. You know, just at the door, imagine that there, you've got a beacon there. The beacon senses your, approaches, your approach. The door opens up. The information about who you are is sent to the greeter uh, or concierge, who then recognizes you and approaches you with your preferences because they have all the information about you at their fingertips in front of them. All of this, by the way, without the user having to take out their phone or a membership from their pocket. So especially if you're carrying around a whole bunch of bags, it really makes life a lot easier. And there are a host of other activities that airlines up till now have thought to use QR codes or NFC to complete. But there's some challenges there because number one, with you know, like a three inch or four inch um, you know, range, it requires that you're right up close to the billboard or location or whatever that call to action is. So it creates logistical problems if it's something that a lot of people want access to or if the signage is located in a high traffic area. And worse yet, people who don't happen to walk right past that never know that that information is there to be had. Beacons with their increased range can really alleviate a lot of those challenges. And let's not overlook the potential for the use of beacons for airport and airline employees. The presence of flight crew, gate, ground handling, and maintenance crews and assets can all be logged by beacons removing the need for paper-based records of tasks and routes completed and whether or not they've shown up on time. Alerts could be sent you know, if they're not where they need to be per schedule. You know, and you can even look at catering operations as an example. Um, airline employees goes over to Sky Chef to get uh, the meals and, and stuff that they need for flight 223. Uh, as soon as they come in, that's logged, as they enter the warehouse, that's logged by the beacon. The app automatically directs them of where they need to go uh, to find what they need. Uh, and on their way out, the beacons, again, check them out and say that they're, they're going on. And when they get to the plane, a bit, another beacon could perhaps check them into that process. Each area is a triggering action, making it easy, easier for the employee to do the right thing without having to do any more work provides better and more accurate status updates and information so that uh, managers can view performance and better understand to see if people are meeting SLAs and to look at individual employee productivity. I'm sure there are many, many more potential use cases for airline and airport personnel, but hopefully all of this starts to get you thinking. Now, the good thing is that all these ideas that I just talked about really line up well with existing air airport IT priorities, according to the CDNACI 2013 IT Trend Survey. 90% of airports expect you know, uh, spending to stay the same or increase. A lot of that focus on passenger processing technology is a key priority. 95% uh, of airports plan to invest in mobile by 2016, with a, a major focus being on helping passengers navigate the airport. 80% of airports plan to invest in new BI solutions. A lot of the reason for that is to enhance airport operations, passenger flow monitoring, and airport resource, resource management. 
these are exactly the kind of things we just spoke about and exactly the kind of things that Beacon can help with a data collection perspective. And from the same survey, you can see real quickly here that 60% of the airports have active programs or plans for real-time geolocation of staff, passengers, and assets, and are looking at NFC as a solution. But in many cases, Beacons can do this job better. So one of the challenges, though, is how do we organize ourselves um, between the different constitu constituencies of airlines, airports, and concessionaires to, to get the all this information to the passenger. Now, it's not like these groups can't play together, but it's a little bit trickier in this situation. And the real question is not so much who owns and manages the beacon infrastructure, but who owns the customer, and how will they access all that information through the that the beacons are triggering. So it's not really likely, it's a little unlikely that the travelers are gonna download an airport-specific app, but it's extremely unlikely that they're going to download the information and not for a concessionaire, even one like Hudson News, which has a fairly good footprint. Um, so the airlines are likely to own uh, the access to the customer and how that relationship begins to evolve around this, you know, we're going to see. Um, CETA has proposed recently a beacon registry idea, which I think is pretty interesting and may help to at least solve some of the problem. Now let's turn over to hotels for a minute. I think that there's a great potential for front of the house improvement enhancing REVPAR through the use of beacons. Uh, this is an infographic from a digital customer experience agency called MCD Partners that queried a thousand travelers, American travelers, on their views of the hotel digital experience. And were asked, how likely would you be to use your smartphone in the following ways? Each of the highlighted items here are excellent use cases for beacons in hotels. Learning about amenities, navigating the hotel, bypassing the front desk for check-in, digital room keys, ordering room service, and integrating with in-room controls. You know, just a couple of quick examples. You know, the automatic hotel check-in. Imagine as soon as you walk into the hotel lobby, a beacon alerts the property management system that you've arrived, dynamically assigns the room, and sends a digital key to the traveler, to the guest smartphone, allowing them to bypass the front desk and lines and go right to the room, all without needing to check in 24 hours you know, in advance or doing other, some sort of manual process. And again, without having to take the device out of your pocket. You know, think every time that you've walked into a hotel, you know, you're probably carrying a mess of bags. Um, maybe you're with your family. And you know, that's a real meaningful con convenience uh, to the traveler. And also thinking about the in-room controls, um, you know, there are some hotels to try and uh, save energy where you have to put the key card in the slot simply to turn on the lights when you walk into the room. But why not just use a beacon to sense that you're in the room, let the lights go on, and enable a whole host of services for your, on your mobile device to control lighting, temperature, TV, and even directly order room service. And this doesn't even include the potential for offer presentment, um, which we talked about a little bit regarding retail, um, or offer coupons to entice guests to partake in activities like golf spa, uh, which you know, increases uh, revenue per guest. Sometimes it doesn't even have to be the coupons. Just the awareness that an opportunity exists could spur higher spend. And again, presuming that proximity is an indicator of intent, as a guest nears the spa, how valuable would it be to receive a notification that there's an opening for a massage or a pedicure in the next 15 minutes or present a screen that allows them to view availability and book a session for later without having to walk up to the counter, especially if they're you know, a bunch of other people uh, talking to the people, um, you know, in the spa. Now, I want to highlight the Starwood check-in and digital key pot pilot that's going on. Uh, it was one of my 2014 T-News predictions that a hotel chain would uh, begin to pilot a beacon program. And it looks like at least I got that right, or at least Starwood made me look good with it. Uh, I'm sure they were working on this well before I was working on my prediction, but thanks, Starwood, anyways. Um, I think it's great and smart that Starwood is piloting this activity. I think it's really smart of them to pair it with a brand that is uh, targeted towards a very technology forward uh, younger demographic, uh, which should embrace this uh, really well. Now, regarding the door locks um, and how they're using Bluetooth low energy to do this, um, I'm not exactly sure how they're doing it, to be honest. But this is an area where I think it would be great if you could invoke some sort of two-factor authentication so that you know that it's not just that I have Glenn's phone, 
but I'm actually Glenn before you let me into the room. Again, this is part of the service delivery, uh, not just offer presentment. And again, this is a case where an open API for Touch ID would come in really handy. And I want to make sure that we touch on you know, back of the house, never forget the employee. Um, again, tracking the presence of housekeepers and maintenance crew, there's a lot of field service type activities that happen uh, within a hotel, and all of this can be logged by beacons. Re again, removing the need for paper-based records, um, and it's going to drive much better data, much more accurate data, and real-time data that could be used for analysis to figure out whether or not um, or, or how well the productivity of those individuals and employees are, um, or as a group, and maybe help adjust and optimize schedules to maximize the productivity of the workforce. Now, one kind of little, uh, you know, bonus cantos for all of you uh, Michael K. New York Yankee fans. Um, uh, I want to give a little shout out to Silver Car because I think that they're doing some really great stuff. I think many of you will know uh, who Silver Car is, kind of a, a new entrant uh, and mobile forward startup in the car rental space. Um, last month, I had a chance to talk with uh, Alan Darnell, who's the CTO of Silver Car, after his presentation at the i for travel mobile conference where I was one of the judges for the Innovation Awards. Um, they are doing, are working on some really cool use cases integrating BLE into the car rental experience. Um, not beacons per se, but utilizing the same technology, but I think that this is really instructive. Currently, you start the rental process by scanning a QR code on the windshield, but then you use BLE in the phone to unlock the car, pop the trunk, and turn off the immobilizer, and then that also triggers the start of the rental period. And then when you return the car, you similarly use Bluetooth uh, Low Energy to log the end of the rental um, because they have uh, deep integration with uh, the electronics and systems of the car. It automatically notes the gas level and re-engages the immobilizer and then sends a trigger for the invoice to be sent by email. For the traveler, this is easy peasy. This is great. And they've got some other really cool things that they told me that they're working on uh, regarding personalization, such, again, triggered by the Bluetooth uh, LE connection. So imagine now you know, you've rented before. Uh, it's always the same car, so it really makes it easy for them to do this. So as soon as you enter the car, seats start to move, mirrors move into where you last had them. Your favorite radio station comes up, comes up, and if you have any favorite locations, they're automatically put into the GPS for you. Neat stuff, great way to use beacons and or the Bluetooth technology, not just for the sake of it, but to do it in a way that really enhances the customer experience. So hopefully I've got you fired up and you feel kind of like a kid in a candy store. Um, so the question is, how do you decide where to start? So at Propellix, we've got a really uh, good um, and strong process for helping you figure out the strategy or approach to integrating any technology around mobile, and it applies certainly to beacons. There's three kinds of stages. There's the direction setting, ideation, and then building a roadmap. So the first part of the direction setting is simply trying to identify the business drivers, number one, and then who are the actors that we're looking to influence. Because the key to any good strategy is making sure that the use cases that you come up with are aligned to your most important business drivers. And, you know, so, so, you know, that's the first stage. The second is to then start to go through an ideation process. Where can you simplify a process? Where can you create more elegance in the customer interaction or reduce the complexity or enhanced uh, data? And as you start coming up with these different ideas, they get aligned both against the business driver as well as that actor, and that helps you build a series of different use cases, which you, you know, which will score. And that's when we get into building of the app portfolio. So we try and help our clients uh, rank and review use cases by five different criteria: the business value, how innovative of a use case is this. Readiness, both from an organizational perspective, but also from an IT perspective. Do you have the systems in place to enable what you want to do? Uh, related to that is ease of implementation. Is this something we can do in two weeks or two years? That has a big impact on how you stack rank these things. And then the risk elements of the idea, um, you know, both around, you know, primarily around data risk. Um, and then the next phase is to 
take these ideas and see if you can group them into modules or even full apps uh, by some sort of commonality of function. And at the end, you wind up with a prioritized list of app candidates that you can start to go build against. So that's what I got for you today. Let me turn it back over to Eric, and we'll try and get to some questions. Great. Thanks, Glenn. Um, we had a lot of questions come in over the line. We had some ones that came in um, both um, within the registrations as well. I'm not going to have time for all of them, but we're going to try to get to a, a couple of them. I thought one um, kind of fundamental uh, clarity, um, Dave asked real specifically that, Glenn, you mentioned around beacons could be used to detect a person arriving at the airport lounge. He said that sounds backwards, unless the beacon is on the person's phone and some other device that detects the phone. Could you explain that a little bit better? Sure. Again, the, the idea is that, you know, it's the app and the back-end systems that control all the logic. So as you uh, approach, yeah, the, the beacon's going to be there, and then the device is going to say, I see the beacon that's at the airport lounge. Then the app's got to be smart enough to go back to the, to the systems and then trigger an event. That event, whether or not the door can automatically open, yeah, that's <laughs> whether or not your systems can support that. But the ability to then send the information to the concierge or the greeter of who you are and prove that, that you're, the, you're allowed in, all that can be done on the back end. So it's, it's the, the beacon indicates the proximity to trigger the action. Right. So does, does that make? Uh, hopefully, that makes some sense. Right. So the so the app has the logic and the and the smarts and the and actually the secure container to be able to to be able to fire up some of those workflows. So the, there's no customer data or anything else associated to the beacon. The beacon is really a dumb thing that's sending out codes and all the logic around how that occurs right. is within the app itself. Exactly. So the, the app would know whether or not you have the appropriate status or to be able to go into that. Right. So the, the app would communicate then over a connectivity of some sort back to a or system somewhere, that system would make some sort of workflow type structure and maybe send that back down to a specific location to say, I know Glenn walked into this location. I want to notify the front desk at that location of his arrival. Exactly. So it's a little bit, so basically the, the, the beacon isn't really capturing any data or anything similar to that. It's this big round robin to say the app understands where I'm at and it's doing this huge run through the cloud, back through corporate systems and back down to anything that's happening on site where there's really no data transferred from the app to the beacon. Exactly. Okay, um, and, and which is a, kind of a key piece to all this since everything else kind of hangs off of that, that one piece of knowledge. So I'm glad we clarified some of that type of stuff. Um, another question was, um, if I go to a store and there are beacons everywhere, just wondering of how my device will react. Do I have to be in close proximity, like less than a meter to the beacon, um, for it to be activated and either present my phone with offers or do something else? But maybe you can talk a little better in terms of if I'm Macy's um, and I have... 35 beacons on a floor for different areas, how, how, how would that phone react? So it's, you know, there are the issues of, you know, the, the ranging, trying to, you know, figure out proximity um, and where you might go in and out of range of a certain beacon. And this is where the ability to maybe tweak the power level um, of the beacon comes into play, but it's also mostly about the structure by which um, you decide to invoke an offer or information about a product based on that proximity. So there are certain things that if you're, if you walk into the front of Macy's and the shoe area is all the way in the back, yeah, the first thing you're going to do is probably not give you information about shoes. It's going to be things to, that you're closer to. Again, proximity to something is the trigger. So, okay. Yeah, and, and I think even part of that as well is the app needs to be smart enough where if it receives 12 different offers, Right, or receives 12 different beacons, that logic in terms of trying to identify where that user is, what should be presented, is really logic that's contained within the app. Within the app or within the back-end systems. Again, right. yeah, you don't want to put too much of that structure within the app because if someone doesn't refresh it and you're changing your, your offers and, or priorities, uh, you know, you're not going to know. So maybe um, continuing along that line, um, somebody asked, if consumers can block beacons at the touch of a button. And maybe it might be makes sense to talk about where we are from a personal privacy perspective um, and kind of where we are in the maturity curve of that a little bit. Yeah. So we're early in the maturity curve and you know it's a little bit murky. Yeah, you know, beacons are an extension of location privacy. So within iOS it appears to be part of location services, which you can turn on or off um, both from a gross location services, but also by an app-by-app -app basis. So you can choose to opt in or out 
to location, including beacons. Um, although right now, although beacons are not specifically called out as a component of the location services um, on, on iOS today, um, you know, at, at least as, as far as I can tell. Um, but there does not appear to be the ability uh, to turn beaconing on and off separate and apart from the rest of location services at this point. I think that this is an area that app makers will have to start to consider, that mobile OS um, the companies are going to need to educate the consumer and perhaps move their products forward to provide a little bit more granularity and control so that the, the consumer is always in, you know, in control appropriately. Absolutely, and even, even it's different across vendors as well, I mean, at least in terms of in terms of platforms. So in iOS now with 7.1, a huge technical leap in 7.1 is now that an app just has to be installed for the OS to register those beacons and present and be able to have the application understand that there's a specific location. Where in 7.0, the app actually had to be either running foreground or at least been in the background somewhere to register those. Correct. So now really you can have a user that can download an application off the App Store Never run it. Well, you'd probably run it to be able to have to log in there and understand who that person is. But maybe log, log in and run it, have be able to reboot a phone and still have that phone receive beacon notifications from that application, which is not available on Android today. And so I think you're going to see maturity here in terms of what allowances there are associated to that. And to Glenn's point, that differentiation in, in the location services structure um, within the iOS stack is not really differentiating, I don't think, between GPS location and beacon location, but I think over time that granularity is going to have to be there, right, right from, a, from a privacy perspective. Um, another question that we had kind of coming forward um, was, is there any sort of um, uh, authentication or just maybe talk a little bit more around the management of beacons today and where that sits? Yeah, like I said, that's a, that's a tough one. There's not... Um, there's not a lot of maturity around this. Uh, it's pretty much a, a fairly manual you know, process that needs to be done. You know, I would recommend looking at companies like, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Radius Networks. They, you know, those and, and others, I think if you also go over to Qualcomm and you look at their you know, gimbal platform, yeah, they are providing some tools today on how to manage um, the infrastructure as well, but it's really pretty limited. Yeah, and I think from our perspective, you know, this is an area that we're expecting to see some major either MDM vendors step forward, some major asset management type vendors step forward in terms of managing these things. If You know, to talk about this on a single store level, and if I have 10 or 20 beacons in there and all that type of stuff is one thing. If I'm a major retailer, if I'm a major airline and I have, you know, beacons at every gate and I'm doing other types of things throughout the terminal and I'm managing 10 or 20,000 of these things that all have a battery life or that all are, you know, a, a plug-in USB to a, a desktop that's just sitting there pinging things out, um, there needs to be some sort of asset management and overall management capabilities to understand if these things are online and available and and other types of things to be able to support that. So I think that's a, like we said, it's an area that, that we're expecting to see some acquisitions and we're expecting to see a lot of change in terms of managing these items. Yeah. You know, one, one thing that um, I, I want to make sure that we circle back to uh, to the previous question just in terms of uh, the privacy side of it is, you know, some people have kind of asked um, you know, me about, you know, the creepy factor. You know, will consumers, you know, start to get freaked out if they, you know, get all these messages all the time? And this is one area where I think, you know, this is where the experiment, experimentation is going to happen. I think that we need to be a little bit cautious in, in how aggressive we are. Um, but I think it's gonna, a big part of that is going to be based on the type of messages that they get. If they're getting service-oriented stuff like, yeah, you know, this is where you go to your uh, connecting flight, yeah, you know, they're going to be much more open to that and see that by and large is helpful and not be quite as concerned. If all you're sending is different marketing messages and offers of things that may or may not be relative, uh, relevant to them, but stuff that you just want to sell, um, it's going to go the other way. And what you want to avoid is to get so aggressive such that they're going to actively move to turn off location services or in the extreme, uninstall the app from their phone. And I think we saw this even in a lot of 
GPS-based marketing types, or you think like things like early days of Shopkick or other types of things where those you walk into a mall and be purely off of resentment around, around discounts and things like that, which I'm entering a shopping, it makes sense. But you saw like a huge potential there. And we've been talking about that idea for over a decade around doing context, contextual-based marketing based on location. But I don't think it's really panned out the way we wanted to or what we kind of expected it to go. And I think part of that is because it was purely offer generation. And I totally right. agree. If, we, if we're mixing messages and, and providing ways to make the, the travel experience or that experience better, um, I think you, having the ability to mix messages and, and offers in there is going to be much easier. So we're running out of time, or actually we're out of time, and thanks for everybody for sticking up past a few li uh, minutes later. Um, we've been doing, you know, this, as, as Glenn said, we've been doing some of these conversations with our clients in this kind of mobile app scoping and planning situation and, and talking a little bit more about building a roadmap out for, for mobile application ideas and understanding how contextual proximity um, and beacons would fit into that. Um, we're also doing a little bit around some of these iBeacon innovation sessions. It's such a good topic and, and a good brainstorming way to think about some use cases for businesses that we're doing even two or three day on-site type things to run our process at a much shorter um, type of, um, uh, much faster click, I would say, and being able to do some prioritization and some ideation around beacon usage and using that to bring into what we've seen in other industries and in kind of extending out what we've seen here is a small example of a lot of things that we're talking about with organizations related to proximity um, and helping build that into their roadmaps or helping us um, execute on those. As I mentioned, the recordings, uh, the recording from this from this webinar as well as the slides will be available later today um, and we'll send you a, an email with a link to grab those if you would like so. Um, and again, um, come sign up for our next webinar. We'll be putting on something in early May and check out our website at www.propelix.com slash resources um, to go back through um, all a bunch of other topics related to mobile strategy and application development and device selection and everything else that's good with it. So Glenn, thank you for your time. All right, thanks everyone. I hope this was helpful. And um, we will see you on our next webinar.